think back to your childhood. Think back to the good old days of VHS and 2D platform games. Right now, 3D polygons running around on screen are cutting edge. You have nothing to worry about except how late you can stay up this Friday night and what horror movie you can convince your parents to let you rent for a family movie night tonight and what topping you may want on your pizza. Ha! Huh. Who are you kidding? There's only two good toppings for pizza right now and that's cheese and pepperoni. Anything else is totally grody. While your mom gets the pizza at your local shopping center, your dad takes you to pick the movie next door in the local video rental. Score. Dad doesn't care what you pick, and he never looks at the ratings on it. You look for the scariest movie you can, and you find it. It's some super obscure monster movie from who knows where. You're going to brag to your friends on Monday about how brave you are and how scary it was. Not. It's so comforting to remember the age of be kind and please rewind. You remember that era through kind and innocent eyes. When you think about that time, it's with a cozy sepia filter. You feel all warm and fuzzy inside. Childhood was such a beautiful thing. And now, now you're an adult with responsibilities in a job and relationships to maintain. All of your favorite video rentals are gone, replaced with streaming services. Everyone everywhere has delivery now. No need to go pick up. Some places don't even take cash anymore. And now there's artisanal pizza? And everyone around you is either vegan or trying to cut out bread and cheese from their diet. You hate it. You hate all of it. You want to be a kid again. You want to go back to the days of static screens and VHS. You want your analog tech back. When you think back to these times, you don't think of the bad stuff at all. You don't remember the inconveniences of it all. You don't remember any of the times you were scared, and when you do, you chuckle at how ridiculous it was to think that you were ever scared. But you miss it all the same. You go through your personal time capsule and look for the old VHS player and giant 19-inch TV and hook them up to each other and look for any old VHS and hit rewind. Nine times out of ten, nothing sinister ever happens when you do this. But in the unique reality of analog horror, it's usually the beginning of something very, very bad. Hello! If you're listening to us right now, it means you've heard our screams, and according to legend, you may or may not die soon. I'm kidding. Or am I? Time will tell. I'm your host, Yadira, and I'm here with my co-host, Christina. Hello! For the record, we don't hate vegans. You can eat all the bread you want. We don't care. And I love artisanal pizza. It's actually my favorite. And this lovely evening, we are reaching you from what seems to be the inside of an abandoned blockbuster, which kind of a bummer. I totally forgot my membership card with my secret other family. You have a secret other family? Don't ask questions. So what do you know about analog horror? Honestly, I have watched pieces of analog horror. However, if I had to describe it, I wouldn't be able to. I don't really have the words to do that. Oh, fantastic, because I do have the words to do that. Well, that's wonderful, because you're leading this episode. Oh, right, that's right, I am. Well, let's uh, start our dive into analog horror. I'm sure by now, everyone listening has gotten a glimpse, or a taste, of the latest sensation sweeping the nation. Analog horror. But what is it? TVTropes.com defines analog horror as a web original subgenre of the found footage category of horror. Pretty accurate and straight to the point. 
Just imagine watching the entire story unfold as if you were watching someone's home video VHS tape. And depending on the story and creator of the story, you'll not only see snippets of someone's home video, but you may also hear clips from an old FM radio and maybe a few old TV broadcasts from some nowhere town. Maybe some good old Polaroids, and if they're really cool, maybe even a playable haunted video game in N64 or Dreamcast or Atari or even first-gen PlayStation Pixel style. There's a lot to say about the genre and everything it's already done for the horror genre, and the impact it's had on the internet. But before we get there, let's take it from the top and where one can guess where the subgenre started. The genre? Uh, found footage. If you've watched The Blair Witch Project, released in 1999, or The Paranormal Activity franchise, originally premiered in 2006, then these movies are probably what you think of when you hear found footage. But these days, I like to think of something much older, something that predates The Blair Witch by 10 years. I'm talking about the McPherson tape. The McPherson tape is a neat found footage movie that presents itself as a tape that was recently released by the U.S. government in 1989 through Project Blue Book. If you recall our Flatwoods Monster episode, Project Blue Book is basically how information on UFOs and extraterrestrials are archived and released. Through this tape, we're given a very vague telling of an incident documented in Project Blue Book. We get no motive from the aliens, or what any of the family in the movie is thinking. We get the idea that towards the end, the aliens are somehow getting into their heads telepathically, but we don't get to experience it as an audience. We also don't get to see what happens to the family in the end. From the get-go, this movie shares a few key characteristics with The Blair Witch and pretty much every single found footage movie minus one key thing. What is that thing, you ask? You're not asking. Well, what is it? Well, it's the internet, of course. The gasp. <laughs> now, you may be thinking, but The Blair Witch used the internet first. It came out in 1999. To which I say, that prize actually goes to a movie by the name of The Last Broadcast in 1998. Unfortunately for The Last Broadcast, The Blair Witch Project had a massive budget and was able to get a far wider distribution. Ah, uh, that is unfortunate. It really is because I think that The Last Broadcast, story-wise and... Creativity-wise and utilization-wise is a much better film. Ooh, you might get some... Uh... And it also had a tiny budget. It didn't even break into the thousands. You do, you do realize people might be very upset with that statement. They can be upset all they want, but it's available to watch on Shudder. Same with the McPherson tape. Guys, you can fight Yudira in the comments. Yes, and also um, Team the last broadcast all the way out here so fight me fight me in the comments and then fight me in the streets wow very ballsy huh <laughs> i mean it's a really good movie it's a fantastic film i highly recommend it well um now that we've touched on the roots of this absolutely creative and impressive genre of horror let's get to what makes analog horror analog horror now, of course, I've told you the actual definition of this genre, but I want to share with you what bits and bobs that make something a piece of analog horror from what I've noticed. The first thing is, of course, the obvious, the VHS feel of what you're watching. This, to me, is very important. For whatever reason, this generation of horror creators and enthusiasts has taken it upon themselves to take their own beloved childhood memories and twist them into something far more sinister. They achieve this by 
presenting everything as if it were recorded on grainy VHS. Can I interrupt you here with a question? Oh yeah, absolutely. Go for it. So as you've said, nostalgia is a key factor in this, and the grainy VHS feel is a factor as well, an analog horror, right? Mm -hmm. So I know for a fact that our childhood definitely differs from those who are born in the 2000s. So does analog horror account for this? Does it evolve or is it just going, is it very specifically VHS? Are we going to see something on an iPhone perhaps? <clears throat> That's actually a really good question because we already have quite a few pieces of uh, analog that are kind of like that. Uh, a good example going way back when would probably be Marble Hornets and Slenderman. There's a name you haven't heard in a minute. <laughs> but also a really recent one that is slowly growing a soft and warm place in my heart. And that's a new home for Mr. Barrington. It's filmed on crisp digital HD cameras that you can buy at Best Buy. Just like as a regular person. Duh, you don't need to be in Hollywood to buy a camera, by the way. And um, it mentions Facebook. Okay. And fa Facebook is kind of old, quote unquote, now. So, you know, the, if you're nostalgia for the old days of Facebook, here's a thing that references Facebook. I don't think anyone is nostalgic <clears throat> for Mark Zuckerberg. I think people are nostalgic for Farmville. Fair enough. <laughs> I played that game. I won't lie. I did once, but then I lost interest really fast. I mean, because same. They had an Avengers game on Facebook. That's I didn't the one know. I, I thought that one was pretty fun. <clears throat> well, the second thing that I noticed about analog horror was, oddly enough, reading. No, you don't get a reading assignment when you dive into analog. There's just a bit more text without voiceover. Probably more than what most are used to, but don't let it scare you away or make you disinterested. I feel it adds to the unsettling nature of analog. The sudden silence that comes when these text snippets take over the screen, along with the usual humming and buzz that comes from a VHS player and TV, when things are quiet, add to the suspense playing really well into the favor of the feeling that the creators are most likely going for. Thing number three is a bit of a combo or a variation of some kind. The thread in the story is something that's either supernatural, alien, otherworldly, or just plain not human or human-like. A good example of this is, well, a new home for Mr. Barrington. Where, if you couldn't guess, the threat in this story is a sentient teddy bear that likes exactly two ice cubes in his water. It kind of speaks for itself if you think back to all the analog horror videos out there that you know of or may not know of, like the Mandela Catalog or the Backrooms, and of course, a classic, Ben Drowned. You know, it seems <clears throat> that Mr. Barrington here is very particular about his ice cubes. I mean, he just wants exactly two. Is that a crime? No, but what would happen if I only have one? You don't want to know. Well, okay then. Yeah, so just stick with two. Always make sure there's two, or don't even offer. The fourth bit that I notice is the lack of presence the characters in the stories have on camera. Sure, we may see photos of them or even hear their voice, but for the most part, they just aren't really seen. We as the audience just see it from the camera POV, which is just the character's POV. I like this method of presenting characters in horror since their perspective becomes the audience perspective, which in turn creates a more immersive experience. The fifth bobble I noticed was a lack of why. There is no reason for the events happening in these stories. They just happen, and often with little to no resolution. Not a lot to say about this point. Things just kind of happen, and the cast of the story reacts, and then it ends. That's kind of like life, isn't it? Or like at least Lovecraftian horror. Oh yeah, life and Lovecraft have a lot in common. 
there is no reason. There is no why. It just is. Well, that's an existential uh, question for you guys, if you want to explore that. Yeah, have fun figuring out the deeper meaning behind um, a new home for Mr. Barrington. And uh, the last piece I noticed, and I think this is a more heavy one. This is a heavy one. The last piece I noticed was the perversion and even destruction of innocence. Sometimes these stories jump out of the gate with childhood trauma or harm of some kind coming to the children or having already happened, like in the children under the house. Analog horror likes to hammer the point of bad things happen to everyone, even little kids, in the most brutal of ways, always putting children in direct harm and never ceasing to be as cruel as possible and always hinting at the gory details but never fully telling us what happened, giving the viewer the unpleasant task of using their imagination. Now, there's a lot more that I could say about analog horror as a whole, but obviously this episode would be way longer if I listed every detail. So I'll just move on and head down to the influence this relatively new genre of horror is starting to have on modern mainstream horror. I'd like to bring up a movie that premiered at the 2022 Fantasia International Film Festival in Montreal. A movie that's been generating a lot of buzz on TikTok of all places for being the scariest film some of these influencers have ever seen. I'm talking about Skinamarink. From the description of the feelings that these TikTokers felt and from the trailer that I saw, this movie was absolutely taking inspiration from the concept of analog horror. In this house is the phrase that's repeated over and over in the trailer, presented in a grainy VHS filter, while two small children in PJs mutter and whisper to each other. As the trailer goes on, we are shown the inside of a family home in the dark, while projections of old cartoons flash onto the screen, seemingly at random all while we hear the static and popping coming from an analog TV. As the trailer continues, the muttering continues, and the phrase, in this house, is repeated, but somewhat distorted. We're shown their drawings and toys and dark hallways being illuminated by the glow of the antiquated TV. In this house. Is repeated once more, before we are met the closest thing to silence before a deep and distorted voice says oh, it's then followed by the screaming and crying of the two children along with something else and the trailer ends it looks promising and is a refreshing change of pace for modern mainstream horror and found footage i'm looking forward to seeing it in theaters real soon and watching it again on Shudder. Do you think that <clears throat> they're going to have a premiere date soon? Oh, yes. <laughs> it's on the uh, the Friday the 13th of January of 2023. How fitting for the release of a horror movie. <laughs> oh, it's so fitting. Jason, be damned. <laughs> now... I feel as though we should give you a few recommendations since you've made it this far. I did make a few references to some fairly well-known pieces of analog horror, all old, recent, and brand new, and even a few I just heard of. I love these so much, in fact, that I'd like to list some off with a brief description and names of the creators of these unique pieces of horror. And before you ask, all of these are available to watch for free on YouTube. Probably something I should have led with. I'm going to start this list with an oldie but a goodie. Ben Drowned by Alexander D. Jad Usable Hull. Ben Drowned started its life on the internet as a creepypasta. 
For those of you who don't know what a creepypasta is, it's a term derived from copypasta, which is just a random story that gets pasted all over the internet, which is where copypasta comes from. And creepypasta is the same thing, but with more horror-related content, like internet ghost stories. Ben Drowned started as one of these internet ghost stories, and its plot is a simple one. It's essentially about a haunted copy of the Nintendo classic Legend of Zelda, Majora's Mask which has a single save game file named Ben Drown. No matter what the narrator of the story does to the cartridge, yes, video games used to be on those before disc, that one save file never seems to disappear. They're then followed through the game by a statue of Link, the protagonist of the game, that has a very eerie design to it. As the story goes on, Things get far worse for the narrator, and regret on their nostalgia for their favorite Nintendo classic is slowly replaced with fear. It's a great one, and one of the original creepypastas to go viral in the good old days of the internet. The next one is one you may have heard of on YouTube at some point if you watch channels like Film Theory. Local 58 by Chris Straub, which coincidentally also started life as a creepypasta, this one being a spinoff of another creepypasta by the name of Candle Cove, which is also a TV show on Shudder. It's pretty, pretty okay. Um, the full title of the show is Channel Zero Candle Cove. Give it a watch. It's pretty good. Production value and storytelling. Local 58 is about a fictional broadcaster and TV studio that started in 1930 in Mason County, West Virginia, in the fictional town of Edenvale. It's honestly hard to explain what it's actually about, but it's worth a watch. It seems like a lot of things are happening in West Virginia. I mean, we had Flatwoods, the Flatwoods Monster in West Virginia, and, and now we have this. We should probably never go to West Virginia. Yeah. Seems cursed. Yeah, it's pretty cursed. This next one has grown quite a fan base online, and it's The Mandela Catalog by Alex Kister. It takes place in an alternate reality where the biggest threats are shape-shifting creatures called alternates. Alternate. Best not to talk too long on this one or else they may see my fear. This one is also available to watch on YouTube. Okay, so this one has grown on me the longer I think about it, and um, I've mentioned it quite a few times by now throughout this episode, but, yeah. and you're gonna think I'm crazy for loving this one, but it's, um, it's a new home for Mr. Berlington from Paul Catalanato. It seems like you have quite the obsession for this it's, one. You've mentioned it so many times. It's really fun. It's 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 good. Um, now, hear me out on this one, though. It's about a contest off Facebook, do not tune me out yet, that's looking for a roommate for Mr. Bearlington, a teddy bear in a black tee and golf cap. I don't want to give away too much about this one, but it's totally campy, and it doesn't take itself seriously in the slightest. It's fun, and it may give that one annoying child in your life nightmares. Oh, and that's Berlington spelled B-E-A-R-L-I-N-G-T-O-N. This stellar creator also created a far more hair-raising series known as The Children Under the House. Give that one a watch as well when you give Mr. Bearlington the chance. Shouldn't they watch <clears throat> Children Under the House first? No, I want them to be traumatized. You're cruel. I am. And the next one, and this is a personal favorite of mine now, but um, this one is by far one of the best pieces of horror I've ever seen from a writing perspective and a technical one. And it's The Backrooms by Kane Pixels. First off, I want to give praise to Kane Pixels because as of making this episode, this guy isn't even 18 yet, and they've made one of the most impressive pieces of horror out there. And as far as I know right now, he's done this by himself. The Backrooms originally came from a message board website called 4chan, off of a thread 
from the Dash X dashboard. Isn't 4chan known for My Little Ponies in the Jar? We don't need to talk about that one yet. Mm. Don't ever bring that up again. I I'm sorry. You should be. Anyways, an anonymous user asked for disquieting images that just feel off. And the first photo depicting what we know as the back rooms was posted. It was just a yellowish hallway. It was uploaded with a caption that read, If you're not careful and you no clip out of reality in the wrong areas, you'll end up in the back rooms where it's nothing but the stink of old moist carpet, the madness of mono yellow. The endless background noise of fluorescent lights at maximum humbuzz and approximately 600 million square miles of randomly segmented rooms to be trapped in. God save you if you hear something wandering around nearby because it sure as hell heard you. The internet fell head over heels for this concept and thankfully so did Kane Pixels. They then proceeded to grace us with an amazing series on YouTube about exploring the back rooms and all their mystery. You know, I've actually seen um, this one, the back rooms, like parts of it. And I have to say that it's honestly very well made. It's so I fabulous. completely agree with you. Like, it's really impressive. I know. Shout out to Kane Pixels. We love you out here. Yeah. So if you don't check out any of the other ones check out the back rooms yes and with that we'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions on analog horror and what maybe what you think needs to be considered analog horror in the comments yes and we'll be linking all of those youtube analog series in the description below we hope you enjoyed the episode and hopefully we'll see you again next time don't forget to like and subscribe 